our Heavenly Father, we want to praise you and we want to thank you because, yes, this is an amazing, amazing grace. And, Lord, we recognize that we cannot in any way, any shape, or any form take any credit for our salvation. But, Father, this has been an unbelievable gift of your amazing, profound, glorious grace. Father, were we able to take any kind of a credit, Father, we would be boastful and we'd be proud. But, Father, we can't because we're the wretches in that song. And, it, and Father, while we were yet dead, Christ died for us. And you, you redeemed us and you rescued us and you breathed life into us again. And all praise and all glory and all honor goes to you. And Father, if there are people here today who don't know you, who have not yet placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today your Holy Spirit would take your word and Father, that they would understand that you would awaken them to see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, their need for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. And Father, for all of us who say we belong to you, I ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would take your word and open the eyes of our heart that we might see that we are called to far, far more than we ever dared dream. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm glad to see you here this Labor Day weekend, and I normally don't do this, but, uh, and Mac is going to be doing announcements at the end, but there are times when I feel, you know, there's some things you just need to hear twice. Is anybody like me and you kind of forget stuff? I know what you're like. I know you can be real. I, I was going to ask you this question, so you can just go, we'll do it. After you're tired of hearing me preach and some guy gets up and gives announcements, you're like, ah. Oh. You're not going to pay attention to that sometimes, but I want you to, so I want you to hear it twice. The Dave Ramsey financial peace thing, if you've not yet gone through it, if you don't know what it is, if you're like, oh, I don't know about that, I want to encourage you, do it. Do it. You'll be so thankful that you did. And I, I know that my wife and I, we did it at home. We, did, uh, we bought the kit, the home version. For us, our story was... She has Crohn's disease. She's had multiple, multiple operations. My daughter goes to the MD Anderson annually for checkups. My daughter, my son, and I keep San Antonio's orthopedic sports surgeons in business. We have for a long, long time. So we had medical bills. Always, 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 always. And um, those things can rack up <laughs> if you've been there. And, and you, have, you don't always have control over when, these, when bones break, when things go wrong, when surgeries suddenly have to, have, uh, have to, have to happen. And, and there were also some things that we just honestly didn't know and we did some we, you know, dumb things. I am so very thankful for that course. If you haven't done it, I really want to encourage you to go through it. And if you have gone through it, it's always good to go through it for a refresher time. So, Lee is right here. You, you see Lee. And after church, you can come talk to Lee. But I, I really want to give that, quote, pastoral endorsement for you to know that it really will. If you'll put the time in, it'll change your life. And it'll set you free from some bondages you may be in. And I want to encourage you to do that. And the other thing is that you're going to hear Mac talk about planning meetings. I'm so thankful that we're in September and I'm so eager to resume all of the prayer and conversations and planning that we had going on all the way up until the summer travel started. We're going to have to pick that up in all likelihood because Sunday nights and we have limited facilities and that's really a cool deal. And check it out. Labor Day weekend, man, and it's almost a normal crowd. That's pretty amazing, right? God's good. That's awesome. But we have space, in case you haven't noticed, we have space issues. And so when we have space issues, we learn how to be gracious and we have to get creative and we're going to get creative. So probably mid to late September, there'll be a Thursday night introductory general meeting. I don't like to have meetings. You know that. I'm not trying to, I, don't, I will never meet you to death. But we have a lot of great things we have to pray and plan. If we're going to keep moving forward as a church, discipleship, Sunday school, so on and so forth. So file that away. So when Matt gets up to talk, you're going to go, oh, yeah, I've heard that. I remember it. And I know it's coming. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Okay. Just want to make sure that we're good on that. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount for some time now. And we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount for quite some time ahead. I think it's very worth taking our time to walk through because in that sermon we see... 
so much of what drives us to the Lord Jesus Christ and drives us to the gospel and we also see what our Christian life is supposed to look like how we're supposed to be we've just completed that, se uh, that section called the Beatitudes the idea that blessed are those and blessed as you should know by now if you've been coming weekly means spiritually happy or spiritually blessed if you do these things and Jesus is talking to his disciples but the crowds because they're fascinated by Jesus they're pressing in and they want to hear and so Jesus is speaking people are listening attentively and we've been um, you can look previously in your own Matthew 5 1 through 9 Jesus has been saying these things to his disciples and in the last two weeks we covered verses 10 and 12 so that's where our review will pick up today Jesus said in verses 10 through 12 of Matthew chapter 5 blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you now these are really hard words and we spent two weeks looking at this idea of persecution so when Jesus addressed persecution and says you are blessed when people hate you his disciples are hearing this you are blessed when you are hated when you are attacked when you are driven out from home family friends from all that is comfortable when people speak hateful things to your face and behind your back reject you or harm you because you belong to me you you are blessed and we saw why so that's that was powerful stuff and we took a look at our own culture today and we were very honest we are not experiencing persecution the way so many are around the world today the way so many throughout human history have experienced persecution. What theologians would call what we are experiencing right now was a soft form of persecution. And I am wholly convinced that that is going to become a harder form. Unless there is a great awakening, a third great awakening in this land. I'm not an alarmist. I'm not that kind of a person. I just notice the social trends. And I've been paying attention, as have many others, as I'm sure you have as well. So it would do us well to come to terms with the fact that persecution is to be expected. People aren't going to love on you and always feel warm fuzzies because you're a Christian. But we see, if you look back in those two uh, verses 10 rather through 12, you see the reasons why you can rejoice in such times and take comfort. So the disciples are hearing this and you might think that as they're hearing this, if we put ourselves in their shoes, how they might be a little bit, what? maybe a little fearful all of a sudden Jesus is talking about some pretty strong things and and those strong things involve them being hated and hurt and harmed Jesus knows their hard words so he knows they're wrestling a little bit with fear so it's no accident that he says what he says next and so he's going to address the disciples relationship to this world this world is going to hate them because Jesus knows the natural or our fleshly response to such hostility would be to shrink back from persecution to avoid this dark rotting world so filled with anger and hostility and so what Jesus is going to say next in essence is don't shrink back you have a big role in all of this and we need to hear this as well because I think if we're quite honest, our default mode when it comes to opposition because of the gospel is that we would much prefer to be comfortable and safe. And we don't want any trouble. <laughs> we want to be able to have people like us and just go along about our business, not have any problems with this world system. We don't want to get on anybody's radar who wants to harm us for the sake of Christ. But Jesus says in the section we're going to look at that we have a role in influencing this world. 
and that this world should be markedly different because we, as the children of God, are here. I want to ask you to think. I don't want you to answer this out loud, but I want you to think. Shouldn't this world be profoundly different because of the presence of the children of God? It should be, right? And I think that as we take a look at the darkness that is spreading across our land, as we look at the decay that's taking place, the fragmentation and all of the, the things that are happening in our culture, we need to be honest with another thing that sometimes we Christians are prone to do. Sometimes we look at lost humanity and we get really mad. Look at all the terrible things they're doing. And why are they doing these horrible things? those people and before you know it it's those people and it's us and it's we're the good people <laughs> we're the sinners saved by wretch and as we've said numerous times as we've walked through the sermon on the mount lost people will always do what what lost people do okay I think that we need to take a look in the mirror I don't want to, I look at the social decay, I look at all the stuff taking place, it's their fault out there. Well, maybe we have a role in this too. Maybe we're part of this problem, dare I say. So, as we get into our text, I want us to promise that we can do away with, with something that's going to be very hard for some of us. Let's not as we look at our text, think about how bad those people are out there. And let's take a look at our role and what Jesus says we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to be. Can we do that? Okay? Because when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he's not saying, those people out there. He's talking directly to them. He's talking to us. He has something for us to hear. And before we proceed, we have to address an elephant that's in the room. And this elephant is in any room anytime you get any Christians together. And it goes something like this. Well, you know what? The world is going to get darker and darker until the Lord Jesus returns. So, you know, what's the point in all of this stuff you're about to start talking about? Because I know where you're going because I read the two verses that we're about to get into. Why polish the brass on a sinking ship? You ever heard that? This world's going to go get worse and worse and worse. Then Jesus will come back. So why spend our time doing the things that I know you're about to tell us we're supposed to do? Why do we have to engage the culture? Because again, it's all going to go from bad to worse. And I just can't wait for Jesus to come get me. It's a really subtle way of saying something really dark. It's a real spiritual way of saying something really dark. How many of you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah goes to that hated city of Nineveh. And they were the proverbial thorn in the flesh of the people of God. They were brutal, harsh, barbaric. They were a wicked people. God says, go to Nineveh. Jonah says, no, I'm going to exotic Tarshish. God says, we'll see about that. The most inglorious entrance ever into a ministry assignment vomited up on the shore, covered in acid and seaweed and all the other junk. And he goes out and he preaches repentance and oh my soul, the people repent. And what does Jonah do? He's so happy and he just praises God, right? He's so thankful that their lives were spared. Mm -mm. He sits on the outside of that city and he's mad. He wants God to call down fire and brimstone and go full-blown Sodom and Gomorrah on those people and it's not happening because those people deserve it. And I say, well, what does this have to do with um, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount? Because sometimes, I'm not saying us because we know it's not us. It's those other Christians and the other churches that you've heard about and maybe seen on TV. Sometimes I've heard stories that Christians kind of have the attitude about, Lord Jesus, hurry up and come get me and I can't wait for these folks to get what coming to them, but get us out of here first. 
Now, I've never heard anybody actually say it in those exact words, but you read between the lines, and that's what's being said. Oh, yeah, one day. It's coming soon, and it's going to go down, and God's going to judge those people, but he's getting me out of here first. Correct me if I'm wrong. But you and I have a very clear responsibility of things that we're supposed to be doing until he comes back. Amen. And we're not supposed to be sitting, soaking, souring, and saying, Oh, Jesus, hurry up and come back and nuke these people and get me out of here. These bad, bad people. We don't know anything about persecution here. And just a quick reminder in case you're wondering what are we supposed to be doing, you can write this down. And yes, I'll get to the topic, but as I was preparing for this, I kept thinking, you know, there's so many things that naturally pop up that I think we're supposed to address here. So just so you'll know, in case you're one of those persons who's saying, well, I'm not polishing the brass on a sinking ship. If you go and you look at all the parables that Jesus had to give, and just look in the Gospel of Matthew alone, I think it's 24 and 25. All the parables about his return. There's some very clear points that he wanted to make sure that we understood. Consistently, here are the main points. One, he's coming back at a time you don't expect. Be ready. Two, no one knows except for the Father when that time is going to be. Three, when Jesus returns, guess what? He expects us to be about his Father's business. <laughs> Not sitting around idly by or retreating or hiding. So why polish the brass on a sinking ship? Because the Lord Jesus said, you be about my business. Yeah, amen. Even if they're persecuting you, even if the darkness and the decay seems insurmountable, even if you think the end is near, you be about the Father's business. So having said that, let's look at our text. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can, or rather, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. We're going to stop there. I could do light. But I, be, I do believe that we need to spend two weeks here. Salt serves two primary functions in Jesus' day. One, it, yes, it was used to flavor at times, but not like we do today where we're, you know, dumping salt on this, that, and the other. But it was occasionally used to, to flavor. The primary purpose of salt was that of a preserving age, and it was used to preserve. It was a preservative. So what Jesus is saying is that his children, his disciples, are to preserve and to hinder the corruption and decay in the world. That's our role, to preserve and to hinder the decay and the corruption in the world. We are here to preserve goodness, godliness, love, virtue, holiness, all that is honorable in a world system that is filled with spiritual death that is opposed to God and the things of God. That's who we are. That's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. Now the salt that Jesus is referring to was found along the Dead Sea and the salt deposits in that area contain not just sodium chloride, but also a variety of other minerals as well. And so the salt could actually become good for nothing when the rain would wash over and over the saltiness out over the years. And when that happened in Jesus' day, the mineral salts really only had one use left, and that would be to scatter it along footpaths to kill vegetation. It was no longer a preserving agent, it could no longer serve its primary purpose. Ironically, the only thing it was good for was to kill unwanted things and be trampled on. If you're paying attention, Jesus is saying some pretty big things here and some questions are being raised and we'll address those as best we are able in the time that we have. Again, you are the salt of the earth. You referring to those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled 
under people's feet. Jesus' followers are to be the preserving agents in this world, and for that to happen, for salt to preserve something, guess what? It has to come into contact with it. You can't preserve something you don't come into contact with, right? One of the biggest challenges in our culture today, amongst Amer in American Christianity, I would say, is that the salt has to get out of the salt shaker. <laughs> it has to. It has to. We're all here today, and I praise God that we're in the, the salt shaker, so to speak. That's great. But if we're going to preserve that which is decaying, then we must come into contact with that which is lost. And we have to be very intentional and be about the Lord's business as we're doing so. If we're going to be the preserving agents Jesus says we are to be, we must come into contact with lostness. We must engage the culture. We cannot retreat even if persecution comes, even if persecution rises through the roof. Over the centuries, some commentators have also noted that there were secondary and tertiary benefits of salt that might have applications uh, in this text. I'll look at that very briefly because I think that the primary and the very clear meaning is the, is the is the main meaning, but there is also some truth to these, so let's address them quickly. Salt is white, which always represents purity. Christians are to be pure in an impure world. Salt adds flavor. Christians are to bless the world and to bring out the goodness and the, as one commentator referred to as the God flavoring that is there in this world. Three, salt stings when it comes into contact with the wound. And some have said that Christians standing for truth should sting a lost world to prick the conscience of a lost world by proclaiming the gospel so that others might come to faith in Christ. For salt makes people thirsty. So ideally Christians should make non-believers thirsty for God and the gospel by the way that we live. They should want what we have. And I believe that all, there is truth to all of those. But again, when reading Scripture, the first and the primary meaning is the, and the most understood meaning of the day is what we need to hang on to. You and I are called to be preserving agents in a decaying world, which means you and I must be about the Father's business and we must be in contact with this lost world. We cannot be agents of influence from a distance, so we must be intentional. Let me give you a few things some of you might want. So what does that look like for me? Some people have the notion that for a pastor, and I always kind of smile when I hear this, because, you know, you, you hear it over decades, and you're kind of like, okay. You hear people say, well, you know, I live in the rural, I live in the rural world. And it's like, yeah, the alternative universe that I live in, I don't ever get to encounter lost people or whatnot. Um, I have to be very intentional, and so do you. So for me, where I know I will always encounter lostness, and my son would tell you this, and when we move, it's going to be very hard for me in that sense, and that the gym, the grocery stores, I have the same places as my personal little Mayberries where I always go on purpose, and I am very intentional about the relationships there because those relationships ideally should be bridges for the gospel. So I'm not isolated from lost people. In fact, I go out of my way. I'm drawn towards them. You're going to need to be very intentional in your workplace, in your community. Even when I go to walk the dogs, I'm really intentional about looking for the same people. You're either intentional or you're not. You're either sleepwalking through life or you're saying, you know what, everywhere the Lord has placed me from my work to my school to my neighborhood, He has placed me there in His sovereignty that I would be salt. Or you're just bebopping along going about your business saying, you know what, I'm fine. Lord, I can't wait. Get me out of here. Got my bags packed. You must be intentional. Okay? And I would ask you to even consider this. That that proverbial thorn in the flesh. How many of you would say at work or at school or in your neighborhood, you've got that thorn in the flesh that you're thinking of right now going, I have to love that person. Anybody? Y'all are so spiritual. That's great. There's two of you. <laughs> the rest of y'all are lying. You know you do. We all have people that we struggle with, right? Thank you. 
Have you ever stopped to consider that perhaps the Lord has placed them in your life so that they might come to know Jesus through you? <laughs> Lord, oh Lord, send somebody else. <laughs> That's what Moses said. That's what a lot of us say. You're at work and that co-worker is over there and you can't stand to be around them. Yes, I did spend time in the quote real world. I worked in cubicles. I washed dishes. I worked at USAA and I still have people that I can look back. At. There were people I thought every time you walked around them and you have to work with them all day long. God placed you there on purpose. You know what my favorite things was? My, 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 my last, my, as, as I was finishing up uh, at USAA, it was so cool to me. People knew I was a Christian and I'm a young recent graduate from college and it's one of those deals where um, you know how things are when you're a young person, right? So I'm the Christian and I'm the guys over there and um, people had all their stories about this, that, and the other and they were nice and whatnot but it's like, you know, there's, there's that guy that slips off and reads his Bible and, and he talks to us every now and then and he kind of, yeah, he's a Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, they treat you different but what was so amazing with the sheer number of times and it blew me away and I might be at my cubicle and we had very short breaks back then and someone would slip over and it's almost like undercover stuff and they get down and be like, hey, can I, can I let me ask you something? And people start talking. It's like, um, what do you do? And, and they're looking for, they think spiritual advice, but what they're looking for is Jesus. My prayer for you is that in your workplace, in your school, in your neighborhood, that you are that reference point that people look to and they say, you know what, I want what that person has. And for that to happen, you can't be in retreat mode. You've got to come into contact with them. And you're going to need to pray especially hard for some of those thorns in the flesh. Amen? But the Lord Jesus died for them too. Okay? Okay? Anyway, salt. There's a historical, a recent, I think one of the more recent ones that, 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 that blows me away. Uh, the great preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in one of his commentaries said this, most historians agree in saying that what undoubtedly saved England from a bloody and horrible revolution as that was experienced in France at the end of the 18th century was nothing less than the evangelical revival that occurred. You see, both England and France were racing towards a dark, godless, and perilous time. But in England, revival broke out and that salt was so salty and came into contact and there was great preservation. In France, not so much. And a bloody, terrible time of darkness and anarchy occurred. And in that particular story, you see how salt preserves. And you also see what happens when salt loses its saltiness. We can look throughout history and we can see that God has used Christians to be his preserving and blessing agents throughout history history. If you look at things and you see how Christians, why do Christians have this preoccupation with uh, producing and making hospitals and orphanages and services for the poor and the downtrodden, fighting against oppression, fighting for, against slavery, leading the abolitionist movement, establishing a variety of charities, charities and ministries to bless humanity. There's no other religion, no other worldview, no other philosophy, no other government program has even come close. Christians have done all of these things not to say, look at us, but because the Lord Jesus has changed us. And that's who we are. We see this call to influence, to be salt, and we can see that Jesus intends for us to play a significant role in preserving and blessing this culture, this world. So instead of saying, I got my bag packed, let me get out of here, maybe we should say, Lord, here I am, send me and make me an instrument of peace and of the gospel in your hands. How much different would the world be? How much different would our culture be? 
a lot of people all over this land are looking to election <laughs> to solve our problems. I'm going to give you, call me crazy. I don't think it matters who gets elected unless the Lord revives his church and there is a great awakening. Nothing's changing. Man doesn't do it. Now, we'll, we'll talk about God and politics. Some of you are like, oh my goodness, he just said something. We're going to talk about that when the time comes. Right now, I want us to remember this very, very important thing. Jesus Christ is King of Kings, and He is Lord of Lords, and He is our hope. Amen. Okay? And when we get that upside down, and we put, our, you know, like way Tony Evans said it, Jesus doesn't ride in the back of elephants or donkeys. He doesn't come to take sides. He comes to take over. That's who Jesus is. Okay? And we forget that. We forget that Jesus is Lord. And as his children, we shouldn't forget that. The second thing you're going to notice in this text, Jesus refers to something that might cause a little bit of distress for some of us. Salt losing its saltiness. Going so far as to saying, and if that happens, the salt is useless. So what does that mean? The first question that people usually ask is saying, what is, is Jesus talking about losing salvation? Context determines everything. Jesus is not talking about losing salvation. He's talking about our usefulness. When the salt of that day was contaminated and it was diluted and it was no longer a preserving agent, it's useless. It's useless when it's contaminated. In the same way, when professing Christians are contaminated by worldliness, we lose our saltiness. Now, I'm not saying that we're to be legalist and separatism because both of those are separatists, rather. Both of those are contrary to the gospel and the gospel message. Rather, the idea that we would become comfortable with sin and allow the world system to shape us as opposed to the word of God, that's the great danger. That's the huge danger. The danger here is that we would be like the world so much that we are of no use to God. Now, if this happens, there are some things that we, we will lose. One, you will lose, and you can write these verses down and look them up on your own. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, if you become very worldly and you become very comfortable with sin, you will lose that sense of assurance. You're going to lose it. You're going to lose that sense of the assurance of your salvation. Secondly, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, if you and I allow ourselves to become so worldly and shaped by the world, we may disqualify ourselves from service. In Hebrews 12, 6, if we find ourselves becoming quite worldly, we may find ourselves being severely disciplined by God. But the thing that I do want you to know is that the Lord perseveres with those who truly belong to Him. We talk about the perseverance of the saints, but I, I, I like it even better. A stronger way to say it is the perseverance of God. God perseveres to complete the work that He begins in those who are truly His children. Write these verses down. Look them up on your own. These are just verses for starters. I could go on and on. Philippians 1.6 Romans 8, 28 through 30. John 10, 29. Ephesians 1, 12 through 14. The Lord perseveres with those whom he has saved. The danger that Jesus is warning about here is us losing our usefulness and effectiveness as preserving agents. There's good news. If you are a Christian and you've blown it, what's impossible with man is not impossible with God. Our God is a good and gracious God who welcomes prodigals home, who is able to restore to us the joy of the salvation that he has given us. And so if you have drifted and wandered, your story's not over, but you must return to him. Now, some of you are asking, well, okay, if I'm supposed to be a salty Christian, then what do I do to be a salty Christian? <laughs> I'm going to give you some more verses and some more things to write down, and please look these up on your own. If you and I are going to be the salt that the Lord Jesus calls us to be and says that we are, if we're going to do what he has called us to do, first, 
We must follow and we must obey. It's a radical idea. <laughs> Jesus asked that profound question in Luke 6.46. Luke 6.46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That in and of itself could be the American church in a nutshell in our culture today. Oh, Jesus, your Lord, but I will do my own thing. And I will do the things that you call me to do if and when I feel like it, if and when it fits in my schedule, if and when I feel comfortable with it. But Jesus asked that profound question, and the implication is that loving obedience is always supreme, and it is expected. Jesus, as King of kings and Lord of lords, has the right to expect that we would obey him. These are not suggestions he's giving us. Two, so many texts we can look at here, but Psalm 1 is always one of my very favorites. I'm not going to read the whole, that to you, but write down Psalm 1, read it. If you're going to be salty, you're going to need to spend time daily in the Word and in prayer and meditating on the Word. Meditating and spending time with God in His Word. That's really important. How many of you look forward to eating lunch today? <coughs> Thank you. I'm hungry already, right? What if you only ate on Sundays? Some <laughs> of the looks you just gave me, like, what? <laughs> A lot of professing Christians do that, though. If you think about it, it's not even eating, it's being spoon fed. A lot of, of Christians in our culture today. I'll hear someone say, oh yeah, I've been a Christian since 1845. Forever, right? Forever and ever and ever. But they still are in their spiritual high chairs needing to be fed by others. They've never matured to being a self-feeding believer. If you are a child of God, yes, when you come to faith in Christ, you are a spiritual infant. But if you are still a spiritual infant, after year after year after year, there's something wrong. If you don't have a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God, that's a huge red flag. If you have no interest in spending time with the Word of God and understanding the Word of God, giant red flag. If all you're interested in is saying, hey, I'll show up and plop me in that high chair on a Sunday and someone feed me and I'll go about my business, big red flag. If you're going to be a salty Christian... And by that, I mean someone the Lord's going to use and you're really going to grow in your faith. You're going to need to start spending time in here daily. Some of you say, well, where do I start? You know what? You start, here's a good thing. One, one thing, that just, don't, just don't do this. Don't do the, you know, flip through and just, you know, whatever, try to find something because you will soon take a text. They may get a pretext, take it out of context and come up with a whole new heretical belief system. Don't do it. <laughs> Start systematically. So, if you would, here's a good starting place for some of you. Perhaps start in the Gospel of John. And so I'll just read the Gospel of John through. Well, what then? Well, you're, you're free to start and go on to Matthew. Or if you want to read Genesis, you can do that. But you start and you systematically and slowly spend time alone in the Word of God daily. And then even so far as to meditate on the Word of God. Let the Word of God sink into you. <coughs> Third, you must abide in Christ. So you have to repent of this whole idea that you can do this whole Christianity thing in your own strength. John 15, 4, Jesus addresses this very clearly. So write John 15, 4 down. In other words, if you and I are going to do what we might call following Christ, then we must abide in Him. We must draw all of our nourishment, our strength, and our power from Him. Related to that, Ephesians 5, 18, we must continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. We must yield to Him. If we're going to be useful, we must be empowered by Him to serve. It's not by might. It's not by our own power. It's by His Spirit. Fifth related to, I believe, number two, is letting the Word of Christ dwell richly within us and letting the Word of God transform our minds. So Colossians 3, 16, Romans 12, 1 and 2. The Word of God changes the way we think. We cannot influence the culture towards God if we're thinking like mere men. 
Sixth, we must walk by faith. We cannot walk by sight without faith. Hebrews 11, 6, it's impossible to please God. The world will not see the power of God at work in us if we are walking by sight. We must walk by faith. And we come back again, number seven. If we're going to be salty, then we have to understand that we're in... We're expected, rather, to go into contact and to be into contact with the lost world. So as we look at our world, as we look at our culture, as we look at fragmentation, decay, as we look at a culture that seems to be racing towards some kind of judgment, we cannot retreat. We must not retreat. Jesus never gave us that option. You have a role and I have a role. Individually and all of us corporately in this world, even if it hates us, the world needs us. And who's going to preserve this world if not the children of the Lord Jesus Christ, too? Who is going to bring out the beauty and the God-flavored goodness in this world? Is it going to be lost humanity? Will it be Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, atheism, agnosticism, any other ism? No, it's Christianity. It's the people of God, the children of God, being who the Lord God called us to be. You of the salt of the earth. Let's pray. We're going to have a word of prayer followed by a time of invitation. This time of invitation is an opportunity for each of us to respond to the Lord working in our life. If you are here this morning and you have not yet placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, today can be that day. And when we stand and sing, if you want to just leave your pew, if you can't, or your chair rather, just come forward and say, I, I want to know how to become a Christian. And we'll set up a time to meet. We'll pray together right here. And you can leave here today a brand new creation. Others of us here are professing Christians and perhaps the Lord is impressing upon your heart the very important and, and urgent need to come home to Him and to let Him do what only He can do in your life to submit to Him as Lord. Others of us here may be looking for a church home and you believe this is where the Lord wants or is calling you to be. And if you want to join with this church, you come forward too and say, I, I feel I'm supposed to plant myself here and we'll set up a time to meet and we'll rejoice together. This invitation is a continuation of our worship. So however you need to respond, please do so by coming forward and saying yes, not to me, but to the Lord as he speaks to you. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness towards us. And I thank you, Father, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who rescued us from the dominion of darkness. We, Father, too, were once lost and dead in our sins. But because of him, we've been given life. And we've been given a purpose. And Lord Jesus, you say that we are the salt of the earth. You're telling us not to run away, not to retreat, not to hide. But we're to walk by faith and we're to be bold and courageous because this lost world desperately needs you. We are your ambassadors. You've commissioned us. Lord, please use us individually and use this church for your glory and for your honor. And for each of us, Lord, I pray that as your spirit is at work in us, that we would each respond to you at this time by saying, yes, Lord Jesus. Whether it's to join the church, to surrender our life to you, to recommit ourselves to you, or simply to come forward and pray. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.